All right, guys, back with part two with John. Now, John is a very traditional guy when it comes to indoor air quality. And a lot of people are, and I am too. Filtration, ventilation, humidity control, all that stuff is fantastic. Now, there is another side to that, and that is UV lights and stuff along those lines, products along those lines. So I do ask John his opinion on them, and he gets to that on this podcast. This is the HVAC Know It All podcast, and I'm your host, Gary McCready. Top contractors across the U.S. only. This one's going to be pretty cool to expand your marketing reach. Property.com is an exclusive network for certified pros. You can get your own custom Property.com webpage for free. You can also get AI-powered reputation management and get some great lead generation and prospecting tools. The Know Before You Go tool is pretty cool. It gives critical homeowner data, like how much they've paid, on past jobs. Join property.com's exclusive network now to expand your reach with homeowners across the U.S. Use mccready.property.com. So that's M-C-C-R-E-A-D-I-E property.com to fill out the form to get approved. Would adding a ceiling fan to a good design be something that would be needed or can we get around that by designing the system properly and, and where the air distributes and all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. I, I've got ceiling fans in my house, but uh, I, I live in the mountains in a cabin and I have no mechanical. I need okay. those fans to get my air mixing. But let's bring this back to indoor air quality. If we don't have good mix, good air mixing, good throw and spread, and, and I've measured this, we get pockets of stagnant air in our living space. And in those pockets, I've actually been able to take particle readings. And if I'm in the airstream or in a good mixing area, my particle levels will be lower because my filter's doing its job. But if I can get my particle into the corner of our, my scanner, into the corner of a room that has a stagnant pocket, by golly, those numbers particle numbers will start to climb. And if those particle numbers are climbing, right, particulates, that's a good proxy to, to determine, hey, you know what? Other pollutants in the space in that stagnant pocket are also accumulating and concentrating. So that's mixing air, be it with a ceiling fan or just having a good design of our system is crucial for thermal comfort and for indoor air quality. My first real experience on understanding how air mixing can benefit a space came not in the, the realm of indoor air quality, but it, it was in the pharmaceutical industry. So I guess I can revert back to, to another application. But in pharmaceutical, what they do, if there's like an, a, 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 a cooler or a freezer and it's a reach-in, they put temperature sensors all over this thing and map it and make sure that they're all within a certain range of each other. And if they're not, that particular appliance won't pass. So these things have to be designed so the air is mixing properly throughout the chamber, because if something's in the corner over here and something's in the corner down here and they're two different temperatures and they're not within spec of each other with the way that product's supposed to be stored, then that's a problem because now their documentation is off. But I found this out, this is going, man, this must be 15 years ago now. There was a walk-in box I was working on. It was part of the maintenance package that was delivered to this one customer pharmaceutical site. And they had two systems. One system shut completely off because it ran out of refrigerant, had a leak, no refrigerant in it. And the other system kept going. But only one half of that box was at temperature. The other half wasn't, even though the systems were equally designed the same and they're a fully redundant of each other. So the one system could handle the load of the box, no problem. But one side was at temp and the other side was a few degrees above it. So all I did was, because they're getting angry at me, they're like, why isn't my box working? I'm like, well, I didn't design it. I didn't install it. I'm just here to service it. So I walked into the other side of the warehouse, which wasn't pharmaceutical. We dragged a big old prop fan that was on a stand. We put it in one corner and we blew it on an angle right down diagonally across the box. And within five minutes, both sides were fully equalized in temperature, fully uniform. And I said, this is the problem. You don't have proper air mixing. Ceiling fans were mounted in the ceiling in each corner of the room. One was blowing that way, and then the other one was blowing back. So it had this circulation like this, 
and then the two evaporators were blowing across this way. So that was my first real experience knowing how important air mixing was. And it just blew my mind just putting the, the fan in there and watching the temperatures just equalize out within five minutes. So it just goes to show you of how air mixing can help even out the temperature of a space. Now you mentioned something interesting, which uh, I do a lot when I go when I go in to do my diagnostics in a home. It's not just indoor air quality; we're changing environments. Um, I, I do temperature mapping, and I do moisture mapping, and I do pressure mapping throughout the whole space, whatever kind of uh, building I'm working on. So that is real important. And then uh, you know, being able to um, gather a certain amount of data points. Uh, I break it up into three categories. I do air safety with testing devices. I'm allow, I am able to uh, see the unseen, uh, identify pollutants in the air that are invisible to the naked eye or can't be smelled. And uh, being able to, uh, then I do what I'll call building safety. And that's being able to pressure map, moisture map, look at the whole building as a system and look at infiltration and different phenomenon that's going in and, and thermal boundaries and pressure boundaries. And then the, the last one would be uh, mechanical safety. And then what impact is my mechanical having on the space? Is my system designed properly? I, am I delivering all the BTUs it has available, like doing system performance and look at sag pressure and airflow and throw and spread and all that fun stuff, we're able to see the whole picture. And uh, so mapping is really important. I do agree with you. It's, it's a very cool concept and a very cool project and procedure to go through when you do map and you can see how um, that mapping shows that if the air is not circulating properly around that room, how it can throw everything off. So it is pretty cool to, to see. Can you just talk to us about airflow versus static pressure and how one how static pressure affects airflow? Is that something that you can talk about with us? Yeah, absolutely. I've been using NCI, National Coverage Institute's uh, testing and methodology for, uh, I think I've been with them for 18 years. So it, it's, all, it's all relative. As static pressure goes up, airflow and performance goes down. Uh, when we're designing a system, said piece of equipment has an available static pressure budget. Uh, and so that means that we've got a uh, budget to go shopping. So uh, most equipment's uh, at a half an inch. Now we've got some other equipment in, uh, that's coming in a little higher than that, but whatever that is. So if it's at a half inch, like we got five bucks, let's go shopping. So we spend two bucks on an evac coil. We spend two bucks on a filter, right? So uh, we got a dollar left. W what do we go shopping for? Duck work. That would be our duck work. And yeah. so, and then, and then, then, not that whole dollar goes towards the ductwork because part of that is going to get spent on our grills and registers and, and the resistance and understanding airflow and static. When we look at a filter, a filter is designed to move a certain amount of air at CFM with a certain amount of resistance, which is static pressure at a certain velocity, which is feet per minute through a certain amount of net free area. And so, and, and the same thing holds true with the duct system. Uh, you know, air is chaotic. Uh, air has no shape of its own. It takes the shape of the container it's in, and a duct system is a container. A house is a container. Our lungs are a container. You get in a car and close the door, that's a container. And, and so we need to move that air at a certain amount of static resistance at a certain velocity in typical residential equipment at the source is about 492 feet per minute. And then we have different uh, we have different requirements for different um, areas. And if we're looking at assigning a system to our sensible heat ratio based on our location, well, hey, maybe I don't need to be running 400 CFM per ton. You know, in California, I'm running 430 CFM per ton because I'm a mostly sensible uh, climate in California. So everything is tied together. It's cause and effect, and we can't discount uh, static pressure. Uh, when we're designing our systems, but we have to look at the whole pictures. Okay. Awesome. So last question I'm going to ask you, and this, this is always seems to be a controversial or polarizing type topic is the, the use of UV lamps to sanitize coils, drain pans, all, all that kind of stuff. Give me your thoughts on on UV. Okay. So out of all the purification strategies that are out there on the market today, UV is one that I do endorse, but it has to be installed properly. Most guys have no idea how UV technology 
even works. And you hear these things, oh, UV kills this and UV kills that. Well, I'm here to tell you that the UV spectrum doesn't kill anything. So it's based on a three-legged stool. One would be the intensity of the UV spectrum, whether it's UV, UVA, UVC, far UV, which whatever spectrum you're in, the intensity uh, is, uh, is what's going to dictate the other two. The next one would be the distance of the surface you're trying to treat. UV does not work in an airflow. Uh, you're not going to be because... Well, let me get to the next one. And the next one would be dwell time. The amount of time that said bacteria, germ, or virus is exposed to the UV intensity, right? So we got those three things. So there are some claims that we're going to go ahead and sanitize an airstream with UV. Well, I'm sorry if a germ, virus, or bacteria goes past a UV lamp. I don't care what the intensity is at 492 feet per minute. It's not going to have the other two. It's not going to have the dwell time and it's not going to have the distance. And, and so we, we it, it's kind of like fire. You need flame, you need oxygen, you need a spark, right? That's the three, that's the three-legged stool for flame. I mean, for fire and, and, or combustion. And you take any one of those away, you don't have combustion. Well, the same thing with UV. You take any one of those three principles away and you don't have efficacy of UV. So on a surface, it works well. The bigger question is, why do we need to treat a surface like a coil? So microbial growth also has a three-legged stool. It needs oxygen, right? So we're going to have oxygen. It needs food and it needs moisture. Well, guess what? We got oxygen. We got moisture on an evap coil, right? It's always going to be there unless we're running heat. And so the way to get rid of microbial growth is get rid of the food. So the bigger question is, oh, do I need UV lamp on my vat coil is, well, but do you need a tighter system or better filtration to get rid of the food? So those are some of the concepts in UV. Then if we start to dive into some of the other air purification, which one of them utilizes UV would be a photocatalytic oxidizer, would be the UV spectrum interacts with a catalyst known as titanium dioxide to create hydroxyl radicals. So it's basically chemistry in a box. So the hydroxyl radicals will attach themselves to a germ, virus, or bacteria. And because they are radical, as they break down, they break down those uh, components with it. Uh, unfortunately, with these other devices, the byproducts, are, are what's alarming. In PCO technology, we've got nitrous acid that's being made. We've got formaldehyde. We've got carbon dioxide. So I get asked all the time, John, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm is looking that at... With, is that with every single one of them, though, or just a specific test on a specific piece of equipment? The, the technology is the technology. You've got titanium dioxide. you got UV, right? There are some of them out there that say, oh, we make hydrogen peroxide. Well, do a quick Google search on what happens when you inhale or breathe hydrogen peroxide. So there's different variations, but at the end of the day, it's titanium dioxide as your catalyst or your substrate interacting with UV to create a third thing, which would be hydroxyl radicals. And so they're all pretty much the same. They package them different. Then you have uh, ionization, either a bipolar needle point, however you want to call it. But in, in my opinion, and I'm a very opinionated on this, and anybody that knows me, our job is to keep inside in, outside out. Our job is to remove pollutants out of the air. Any technology that puts an additive into the air as part of their technology is absolutely a no-go. We're going the wrong direction. We're trying to remove stuff, not put stuff in, and have this battle in, in, in the space at a micro level with byproducts that can be worse than the pollutants we're actually trying to address. If anybody's ever even identified the pollutant, remember I said pollutant identification and source control uh, will give us a, a fighting battle on how we address that. In my opinion, putting an additive into, into the air through, through said device is not the direction to go. Then we got to talk about efficacy. So if we're going to put a device in a plan, right? And, and, uh, and all the air, all the volume of air has to go through 
or over that device to, for its technology to work. We're actually only, if you look at, let's just use a 510 unit. It's a nice round number. So we got 2000 CFM. And so we're only filtering 10% of that air because that's all the volume of the air that can go across this device. And then that air that just got treated re-enters the space to mix with the other pollutants and come back. We're looking at the law of diminishing returns. Now, depending on what's in the space and how concentrated those pollutants are, it's a losing battle. And so the squeeze doesn't match the juice, in my opinion. Yeah, you, you are very opinionated. On <laughs> I can tell. So, let, But let me ask you this, because you, you brought up UV dwell time and, and distance and, and stuff like that. What if you installed UV in a, in a return duct where the, the air is moving slower, but in parallel with the duct. So as the air is moving down the duct, because it's in parallel, there's more dwell time. What, what do you think of that concept? Are we treating the surface or are we treating the air? We're treating the, we're trying to treat the air. So we're, we're adding, we're adding more UV lights in parallel with the duct. So as the air is moving slower in the return duct, we have more dwell time because it's moving slower. And because we are running a parallel system, not perpendicular system. We can hash those numbers a bunch of different ways. So we're, we're trying to give more, more dwell time. And so are we slowing the air down? Are we at three, 300 feet per minute instead of 492 feet per minute? Are we at 350 because we're in a, a, a different climate zone with a different sensible heat ratio? And is that enough? I don't think it is. And then to your point, oh, we're just going to add a bunch more UV lamps. Well, what are we doing to the airflow? Because anytime you put anything in an airstream, we're increasing static pressure. I mean, you can put a teddy bear in, in an airstream and take a static pressure reading off of it. And so now we're at it, you know, to what end? In my opinion, I don't think we're in a place in a residential application where we can put enough UV lamps in a return air plenum to have good efficacy treating the air. Now, the surface of that return air plenum is going to be clean as a Dickens. <laughs> and it's that. So the, the question is, you know, is that the battle we want to fight? Shouldn't we have a tight system with good filtration and then we don't have to rely so much on, on other things to keep our system clean? You know, I, I install units using, um, well, I, I have my filter out, which is the DF-16. And it's MERV-6 infiltration for residential, right? And I've installed other people's products that are close to that, but I built systems that are tight and, I, and by measurable you know, doing a duct test tight with a tight filter with no blow by, and I will never have to clean the heat exchanger, the blower, the coil, or the ductwork for the life of the system, 20 years. I, I agree with that. If the system's tight, there's a good filter, there's no bypass around that filter, then that system's going to stay clean. Yeah. So therefore, a UV light isn't really your answer. Now, can it be like a little added something if somebody's very sensitive to that? Well, Absolutely. It's just like the mindset that an e ECM blower motor is going to take care of inadequate ductwork. It's just not going to get there. Okay. Well, I mean, that was the last question I wanted to ask you. So, I mean, we can obviously further down the line uh, talk about all of this a bit more in detail because we went through your six points and we did talk about them. But I, I think there's more to discuss here from a building science standpoint as well and in a building envelope standpoint too and, and HVAC versus building envelope which one is the actual problem uh, so maybe we can get you back on to talk about that kind of stuff down the road John oh yeah it'd be my pleasure I, I love this stuff so I, I teach a, a two-day 16-hour class and even that is not enough I could probably go 32 hours so <laughs> I, I'd love to come back and we'll take take a deeper dive amazing thank you very much for your time today John all right enjoy your day